Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to speak um, today about improving kidney transplantation by preconditioning. Now, as we've already heard, um, this um, graph really shows the renal transplant activity over the last decade. Um, and we can see the line... Well. You can't hear me. This graph shows the renal transplant activity over the last 10 years and the line on the top uh, represents the transplant waiting list and you can see that this is gradually increasing um, and currently only one third pe of people on that transplant list will receive a kidney transplant each year. And underneath we have a, a bar <coughs> chart of the different types of organ donors. In light blue is the living donors and as we heard before we've seen a significant increase in this donor type especially over the last five years. In grey, we have our DBD, or which is our donation after brain death, which is our traditional um, source of organ donors. And in dark blue, DCD, which stands for donation after circulatory death. So these are kidneys that are taken out after the heart has stopped. So these kidneys have some injury. And this is what I want to talk about today. So these marginal kid kidneys, including the DCD, donation after circulatory death, and also ACD, which stands for extended criteria donors, or these are older donors, and we're using more and more of these kidneys for transplantation. Now, these are a very important source of organs, and I think that these can be utilised more to try and reduce the transplant waiting list. However, they have their problem in that they're associated with high rates of delayed graft function and slow graft function. So this means that they don't work immediately after they're transplanted, they have some injury, and therefore the patient may need some dialysis therapy until the kidney starts to work. In some severe cases, they have primary non-function, so they don't work at all. Overall, this early graft dysfunction causes, um, well, it complicates patient treatment and increases the incidences of acute rejection and overall can prolong hospital stay. So early graft dysfunction is caused by kidney injury and kidney injury is caused by multiple factors. It's caused in, in the donor, so this could be due to the donor health or the, the circumstances surrounding the death preservation, so for the way in which we preserve an organ or for how long we preserve it. Reperfusion, so after, immediately after transplantation, when oxygenated blood is reintroduced into the kidney, we get an inflammatory response which causes damage. And also due to the recipient, again, recipient's health can affect early graft function. Kidney preservation plays an extremely important part in transplantation and the main concept is to maintain the organ in a viable state from the time it's donated until it's transplanted. And traditionally we do this by hypothermia or, or very um, briefly refrigeration. So the concept being is that we reduce the metabolism, so therefore we re reduce the temperature and then the requirement for oxygen. There's two techniques static cold storage and hypothermic machine perfusion. A static cold storage is, the, is what we mostly use in the UK. It's a very simple technique of preservation in that the kidneys flush with cold preservation solution and then stored on ice until it's transplanted. Hypothermic machine perfusion is slightly more complex and it involves placing the kidney on a machine like we see here and circulating cold preservation solution through the kidney at a low pressure. There's really been little development of hypothermic preservation techniques since the 1980s, although we have seen some development in, in the technology. The basic principle of hypotherm hypothermia causes injury over time. The longer an organ is stored under these conditions, the more injury it gets. And it's thought that these kidneys from marginal donors, so the DCD and the ECD kidneys, are particularly susceptible to this type of injury. The alternative is to use the preservation interval to actually improve or condition the kidney. And we can do this by introducing what we call a short period of normothermic perfusion. So this is in effect actually warming the kidney up before we transplant it. And in doing so, we restore renal function and metabolism. We can improve its condition, can reduce the injury, and thus improve the early graft function. This is a, a picture of our laboratory-based um, system, and the system is actually based on um, cardiac bypass technology. And you can see the kidney um, being perfused. It's in a kidney chamber, um, blood going into the renal artery and out through the renal vein, and that's the ureter cannulated. These are the main components of the, the system highlighted, but I'll go on to talk a little bit more about the system uh, later in the talk. 
Our laboratory experiments have shown that if we warm a kidney up for a short period after it's been stored cold, we can actually restore the energy within the kidney. We feel this is particularly important in preventing injury. And this first graph um, shows you the ATP to ATP ratio. And basically what this means is when a kidney is stored cold, we get a low ratio, so there's a low energy level in the kidney. Whereas when we restore, um, warm it up to normal body temperature, we restore this energy process. We know also that by warming it up for a couple of hours, we upregulate this gene or this protein, heat shock protein 70, which is known to have a role in um, repair and regeneration. So overall, we feel that warming the kidney up for a short period has a conditioning-like effect. We then wanted to assess this technique and we used a, a preclinical study using a porcine autotransplant model and we found that this short period of normothermic perfusion, actually the animals that had this um, type of perfusion, their renal function recovered much um, quicker compared to kidneys that were stored cold. And you can see this on this um, graph which is the serum creatinine levels plotted after transplantation. In orange we have the normothermic group and they all recovered function compared to the ones that didn't in the cold group. So then we wanted to test this in clinical practice, so we, well, we carried out a pilot study <coughs> to determine the safety and the feasibility of this normothermic perfusion in, for marginal donor kidneys. We had approval from NHS Blood and Transplant and also from our local uh, clinical ethics committee and also we had a, approval from the, the Hospitals Interventional Procedure Committee which is a, a committee that's designed a regulating authority within the hospital to oversee the introduction of new techniques into clinical practice. Normothermic perfusion can be introduced quite simply in that once a suitable kidney has been identified and the, and the recipient is, is consented, whilst the recipient's being prepared um, for the transplant procedure, we've got a window in which to perform the normothermic perfusion. The kidney's prepped, so the renal artery, vein and ureter are cannulated. It then undergoes a period of normothermic perfusion around about 60 minutes. So once the patient's ready for the transplant procedure, the kidney's removed from the system flushed with cold preservation solution and then transplanted immediately. This is a schematic diagram of the system and as I mentioned before it's based on um, paediatric cardiopulmonary bypass technology and we perfuse the kidneys with a blood-based um, solution. So the blood is put in the venous reservoir and then that's pumped through a centrifugal pump into a membrane oxygenator and heater, that's where we add oxygen and it's warmed up to normal temperature. It then enters the arterial arm of the circuit and into the kidney via the renal artery. It's allowed to drain out through the renal vein, back into the re reservoir, and then just continually recirculated round. And we can see that by re restoring um, flow to the kidney, the kidney will actually start to produce some urine. And in designing this, we wanted to create what we term the ideal perfusion conditions. So we perfuse the kidneys with a, we actually use one unit of cross-match packed red blood cells which is diluted with a crystalloid solution. We've got a short video that is not coming up on your screen but it just it shows the kidney in the chamber and it's starting to produce some urine. We keep it at just a slightly lower than mean arterial pressure and temperature just, just below normal. We add a <coughs> nutrient solution um, to the kidney, um, protective agents such as dex dexamethasone which is an anti-inflammatory, uh, a vasodilator and also some antibiotics. We've performed 19 of these cases in, in Leicester, um, 18 from extended criteria donors and one from a DCD donor. The average donor age was uh, 57 and in uh, four cases uh, the donors were male and 15 were female and the majority of them um, death was caused by an intracranial haemorrhage. All kidneys were transplanted successfully and average uh, recipient age was 57 years and 14 were male, 5 um, female and all patients were treated with the same um, standard immunosuppressive protocol. There were no complications during the perfusion and kidneys were perfused for just over 60 minutes. Um, in all cases the renal blood flow we can see here plotted during perfusion increased and the resistance fell in the kidney and they all produced some urine although this did vary significantly ranging from 30 to 450 mils during this hour and the temperature um, was just, uh, just below 35 degrees. And we, can we kept the perfusion conditions um, stable with a normal st stable um, pH and PO2 and PCO2. Three of the kidneys had a warm ischemic insult, so these kidneys have had additional damage of periods of 
13, 25 and 35 minutes. So that was before the organs were retrieved. The average cold ischemic time was just over 12 hours, which is relatively short um, for the UK. And the median length of hospital stay was seven days. Now the outcome um, of these 19 patients, we only had um, all the graphs worked. We had no instance of primary non-function. We had one patient with what we term delayed graft function, so the kidney didn't start to work immediately, and they required two episodes of dialysis within the first week. With two patients with slow graft function, um, so this was that the creatinine was slow to fall during this first week, and four patients have had episodes of rejection within the first three months. All of the patients are doing extremely well and seeing creatinine levels have continued to, to fall after the transplant, and we've currently, I think, four patients out to 12 months that are doing extremely well. Briefly, I just wanted to compare these results of, uh, though it's very early days, but with this pilot study of 19 patients, and um, we've compared um, this to an historical group of um, kidneys from ECD donors in our group over the same time period, and we performed 30 transplants where the kidneys underwent just static cold storage, and we had a delay graft function rate of 40% in these kidneys compared to only 5% in normothermic group. So I think these results are extremely promising. And we had the same incidence, um, just above 20% of acute rejection. So in summary, this is the first uh, reported application of normothermic kidney perfusion in clinical practice. We believe that normothermic perfusion has a conditioning-like effect. It's safe and feasible. And we know that we can restore aerobic metabolism whilst the kidneys outside the body. And this may go towards improving initial graft function. And lastly, I just really wanted to highlight um, what the ability of this technique and other things that we can do with it, not only resuscitating and conditioning the organ, but in the future that this might be used to determine viability, to actually test the organ before we transplant it. And this could lead to more of these marginal kidneys being used. And also, we could possibly introduce therapies into the kidney to improve its condition further, such as stem cells or gene therapy. And I'd just like to thank Kidney Research UK for supporting the clinical application of the study. Thank you.